you are attending this webinar because you need PDH credits for Illinois or Wisconsin professional engineers, uh, you do need to answer the quiz questions as they come up, and you need to get, I'm trying to think of what it was, 70% of them correct, so you know, a, a D score if you were still in high school. So please do answer those questions when they come up. Do not skip them. Uh, you will need to answer them or you will not get a, a PDH certificate. If you don't need PDHs, no worries. Feel free to answer the questions anyway. Uh, the more the merrier. All right, welcome. Uh, I'm Ryan Holger with Temperature Equipment Corporation, and this is kind of part two of the duct sealing and testing webinars. Last week we did residential. This week we are doing commercial. Uh, there will be a lot of similarities, but there's also tons of stuff that is different in terms of codes and procedures and uh, calculations, uh, but obviously the basic principles are going to be the same. Um, ask me any questions as we go, type them in the question box, and every once in a while I'll take a look over there to see if anything has come up that we can try to answer on the fly. And why is it not clicking? All right, so some of you guys have seen me use these slides before. I use them all the time to scare the hell out of you that we waste a lot of energy. And depending on whose data you look at, buildings, both residential and commercial combined, use about one-third of the total energy of the United States. Manufacturing is another third, and transportation is another third, basically. When you look at how that breaks down within the building sector over in the little pie on the right-hand side, you can see about a third of that is HVAC, heating, cooling, ventilation. I suppose you could lump water heating and refrigeration in there and say that we affect about half of that world in our industry. Specifically, when we look at commercial, about a quarter of the commercial building energy usage is for space heating, uh, and then another good quarter of it is cooling, ventilation, water heating, refrigeration, if you will. Um, a quarter doesn't sound like a lot, or even a half doesn't sound like that much. But when you start looking at the other pie wedges, they're getting smaller and smaller over time, electronics, computers, lighting, etc. And those big ones over there, adjustments and other, that's stuff that's generally a mystery to a lot of people. I'm not sure exactly why that can't be quantified a little better. But heating and cooling are definitely still huge targets that we can mess with. Specifically, looking a little deeper in there, on the left-hand side, is how much energy as a country we use to cool stuff. On the right-hand side is how much we use to heat stuff. And it's pretty close, 1.4 quads and 1.7 quads. And this data is about 15 years old, but percentage-wise is still a similar scenario. Uh, you can see half of that cooling energy is packaged rooftop units. Uh, and on the heating side of the equation, a little more than a quarter of it is, is you know, packaged ducted units. Uh, so there's a lot of duct work going on that we can deal with. And then we have this parasitic energy the energy that we use to transport the other energy around, right? So we spent some energy and money to make cooling, we spent energy and money to make heating, and then now we got to spend more energy and money to move the heating and cooling all around. And you can see the big pigs there are the supply fans and the exhaust fans. Um, most of the codes, as you probably have noticed lately, have been picking on the fans, and that will continue to happen. We have rules for VFDs for certain horsepower fans now. We have rules for multiple stage fans on rooftop units in the codes, and we have horsepower limitations on big air handlers, and all that stuff is just getting more and more strict because fan systems are pretty big consumers of energy for our country. As you're probably aware, the United States and Canada are probably the main places you can go in the world that ducted systems dominate. When you go to other places, Europe, Asia, etc., you'll see a lot of water-based systems and refrigerant-based distribution systems. But here in the U.S., we got a lot of duct work, and unfortunately, that duct work leaks quite a bit. When you look at some of that power consumption, specifically for the fans and motors, um, for, for this particular study here, 37% of that peak power that we're using is fan and motor related. Um, so if we can do anything at all to chop that down, and most of you guys are familiar with the fan curves, fan laws, uh, so if we can do at least a little bit to chop that down, it'll have a huge effect on power consumption. So duct sealing specifically, uh, here's some data here um, from ASHRAE, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. If not, please join ASHRAE. We love you. Um, first thing, uh, system leakage significantly increases building energy leakage. Um, a lot of duct work is outside the typical condition space, and even when it's not, sometimes it's in these quasi condition spaces where you're not really sure it's part of the condition envelope or not. Um, so any of that kind of stuff that leaks out of the duct work um, is going to leak out of the building. Uh, VAV systems, which are very popular in commercial building environment, um, if you've got a VAV system that's leaking 20, 30, 35% of its, of its uh, uh, air, 
that equates to a substantial uh, portion of the dollar amount that's involved here. Um, so VAV systems in general uh, use 20 to 35 percent more if the ductwork is leaky than if it's a tight system. And we'll kind of define a little bit here what tight means and leaky, because right now, right now those are kind of you know not defined words. I could say something's tight or leaky, and you're like, okay, sure. We'll define it. We'll quantify it mathematically so you can see what tight and leaky is. But a leaky system is going to waste about a third of more energy than a tight system. Uh, exhaust fan systems, same kind of story. Um, a lot of exhaust system and exhaust shaft sealing has been going on lately because this is a huge consumer. A lot of exhaust systems run 24-7 as opposed to other systems that may cycle more. Uh, so anything we can do to fix stuff there may have a larger dollar impact for us. But if I have 20% duct leakage on my exhaust duct work or my exhaust shaft, uh, that can cause me to have fan power increase about 95% more. Uh, that's a lot of dollars and a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of energy and a lot of money. Um, some of the rules for duct leakage is changing. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on with the energy codes, um, but you are going to see some more standards come out from ASHRAE that involve duct leakage specifically. Uh, but that's a little bit down, down the road here. Um, so, like commercial duct work, which is what a lot of us are affected by, right? I know some of you guys do hospital work and some of you guys do residential and stuff like that, but we're sticking with commercial for today's topic. And like commercial duct systems, so offices, schools, things like that, that is by far more than 50% of the market. So that's good. it's a big target. Um, that duct leakage in those type of systems based on two different studies is about 30%. So Assuming that what happens in Florida and California also happens in Illinois, and I know that's a huge assumption, right? But let's just say it is. That means 30% of the air you pay to heat and cool and move down a duct system does not make it to the space at any point in time. It leaks out of the ductwork and goes back into the plenum return, or it leaks out the ductwork and goes out of the building entirely, which is even worse. So 30% of the air on an average commercial duct system is leaking. Uh, it's a pretty big amount. For you guys, last week on the residential side when we did that webinar, you know that's a pretty similar number. It's pretty it's pretty common for both scenarios. Um, commercially, we have duct leakage classes, uh, and these are dictated to us by SMACNA. So we'll talk a little bit in a couple slides here about some of the SMACNA standard language. Um, but there are different classes, and I'll show you what those classes look like. Um, but a leakage class of of uh, of 200 is very common uh, class that you'll see. So if we look at that specifically, take an example of 10,000 CFM, which is a pretty large air handler, moving air at 1.5 inches of static pressure, which is fairly common for light commercial system. Um, that co correlates to about 3,000 CFM of leakage on a class 200 system. Class 200 is what most duct systems are built to. So on a 10,000 CFM system, you can expect to get about 3,000 CFM leakage, which is 30%, like we said. If you can get it down to a, uh, a rating of four, uh, which we'll talk about how to do that and what that really means mathematically, that's only 62 CFM of leakage instead of 3,000. So it's a huge difference if we can go down a couple classes on how we seal our ductwork. Uh, there's the full link if you want to see how that's MACNA standard works. We'll talk about it a little bit more in a couple slides. On average, 10 to 20 percent of the air provided by a supply fan never reaches an occupied space. All right, I said 30% of the air leaks, right? But some of that leaks out of the ductwork and wafts it way down through the ceiling tiles and everything into the conditioned environment. But 10 to 20% of it never makes it into the conditioned space at all. It just goes away, right? So it goes into the plenum return and then it leaks out the sidewall of the building or it leaks out of the ductwork into an attic of the building and then out the attic out the building. Um, so 30% duct leakage is correlating to 10 or 20% of the air never making the space at all, which not only has an energy impact, obviously, but it also has a comfort impact. If you're trying to get a certain amount of airflow into a room and you can't get it there because the ductwork all the way down the line is leaking and the last one on the run doesn't have enough air, it's very probable leakage is, is, is a culprit there. Uh, Department of Energy is also involved in a lot of the things we do lately in terms of energy conservation in buildings. Uh, a lot of their studies dictate to what utilities rebate and what codes look at, stuff like that. So this particular Department of Energy study done with uh, FEMP uh, ranked all the different topics, all the different things that can be done in, in technology-wise in a building to save energy. 
right? Three of those top eight are things that are HVAC related. So number two on the list, condensing boilers. Uh, so obviously replacing your existing standard efficiency boilers with high efficiency condensing boilers, 90% and better, is the, in this case the best HVAC thing, HVAC thing you could do in a commercial building uh, from an energy standpoint. Um, ground source heat pumps was number six on the list, and I think you guys all understand how they work and how efficient they can be. Uh, ground source heat pumps aren't super cost effective on small residential stuff, but on larger scale buildings, they become more cost effective because you can share wells. Um, and then this is also a national study, I should point that out. So in some places, it's more cost effective than others. And then number eight on the list was duct sealing. Um, so it's pretty pretty good metric that you can be up there more uh, higher ranking than chillers or higher ranking than VFDs you would think would be up there. Right, but duct sealing beat those kind of common things out that we think about all the time. All right, so we're going to launch our first quiz question here. And I'm going to keep all these questions pretty benign. They shouldn't be anything too hard. As long as you're reasonably paying attention, you should be golden. I'm going to read the question first, and then I'm going to let you answer them, because I found that if I pop the question up right away, then a bunch of people uh, uh, don't really think the wording through. Not that I'm trying to be tricky here. All right, so question number one, which most represents the typical commercial duct leakage? Choice A, 5%, choice B, 10%, choice C, 30%, choice D, 50%. So of all the CFM going down the duct, on average for a commercial building, how much of that is leaking out of the duct? While you guys are answering that, I'm going to look and see if anybody typed any questions in so far. Looks like nobody has, but then again, we haven't gotten into the real meat of anything yet. All right, 84% of you voted, so I'm going to close this poll in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, closing it. And I'll share the results with you. Uh, you guys did very well. 91% of you got the correct answer, which is 30% of the duct work in a commercial building leaks on average. All right, we'll jump back to the slides over here. All right, so energy savings. Where's the places that we can actually get the savings of energy from repairing leaky duct? or not even repairing it, just building it tighter to begin with in some cases. So we have three categories here on the columns of examples of things that we're looking at. One is exhaust shafts, and like I said, that's been a big target for, for duct sealing lately. Uh, duct Exhaust shafts tend to be fairly large. Sometimes they're made out of sheet metal, sometimes they're not, right? It could be drywall even, unfortunately. Um, but the shafts tend to be very large, which means lots of surface area, which means more potential for sealing. Additionally, they tend to be connected to exhaust fans that run 24-7 in lots of applications. So the potential gets pretty large. The second column is, uh, is uh, air handlers, right? So larger pieces of equipment. And the last column is, you know, packaged rooftop type stuff, your typical 5, 10, 15 ton rooftop category. So on exhaust shafts, the most common place we're going to get the savings from is by reducing the horsepower of the fan to begin with. All right, this is assuming your exhaust system got balanced at some point, which hopefully it, it did and does, right? So if I go and I test your, system, your exhaust system and I'm not getting the airflow requirements that I need to meet the original spec and CFM for each um, grill, I'm going to go speed the exhaust fan up, right, to get that airflow that I need as an air balancer. I'm either going to speed up the VFD or I'm going to change the shivs on a fixed speed device. But I'm going to speed it up to get the airflow I need, right? Instead of doing that, which is obviously going to cost more energy over time, the better solution would be to seal the ductwork so I don't need to put a bigger fan in or I don't need to speed my existing fan up. So the, the horsepower savings on the fan is huge on these systems. Additionally, if I am exhausting, you know, um, my, if my exhaust shaft is leaking, I'm pulling air in from other cracks and crevices that's just adding additional load onto the system. Uh, on the larger air handler side, obviously I'm going to reduce the fan horsepower as well. I'm also going to reduce the heating load. Um, anytime I'm leaking air out of the system, 
Uh, some portion of that, like I said, is never going to the conditioned space. It's going out into other areas, wall crevices, cavities, and then working its way out of the building. So that air has to be made up by other air, which has to be heated and cooled at some point in the system. So I can reduce my fresh air intake load and my heating load by having tighter duct systems. Uh, and then a similar kind of scenario for, for uh, package uh, type equipment as well. Some visuals on some of that stuff, uh, package rooftop systems. Um, you can see here, let's see if our little arrows will pop up here, right? So this is my package rooftop unit here with the green, awesome looking fan. Uh, my duct work's going from left, from right to left. Let me see if I can get a little highlighter thing to go here, right? So air's coming in, my outside air's coming in here, my return air's coming up, going through the fan, being heated and cooled, and going down through the duct system, and hopefully going out the registers where it's supposed to go. However, some of that airflow is in fact leaking. Oops. All right, so that airflow is leaking. Once it leaks into that ceiling cavity, then it's, you know, it could go anywhere from there. Some of it will leak into the space. That is actually possible. But a lot of that is going to leak out the sides of the building or out the roof deck specifically, depending on how tight the roof is and how well it is sealed. And typically, it's not sealed very well. Um, constant volume systems, um, low pressure leakage, short circuit to duct system. So if I leak air out of the ductwork into that plenum cavity, some of that is going to be pulled right back in through the leakage on my return duct. Or I could actually have a plenum return, which which case then that's not return leakage, it's just the return duct. Um, you know, my supply duct is inside my return duct if I have a plenum return. So on these systems like that, I could be short cycling. I'm paying to heat and cool air and move it through the system, and it's going right back into the return, and it's bypassing the conditioned space. It's never making it into the space at all, which means I have to run the unit longer in order to get some more of that air to come into the space and to reach the thermostat until it's cycle off. So it takes longer for me to heat and cool the space, and it uses more fan energy because I'm moving more air through the system because some of it's bypassing and never actually going into my actual space. This causes excess fan energy usage, causes excess fan noise, which is something people probably don't think about when they think about duct leakage. Uh, I'm adding extra fan heat to the system, which obviously is a credit in the winter, but it's a penalty in most of the, of the seasons because most commercial buildings are cooling dominated. Uh, and it's excess ventilation, uh, cooling, and heating load that I have to deal with. VAV systems, uh, similar kind of thing. Depending on where it's leaking, it can have different effects on the system. If I am downstream of the VAV box, um, my VAV box, that air leaks out. I'm, my VAV box, if you don't know, was programmed to give me a certain CFM for whatever scenario I'm currently in. So it's going to give me that airflow one way or the other. And any leakage I have after the VAV box, downstream of it, if it doesn't go into the space, that doesn't get recognized anywhere. And what ends up happening is that my thermostat takes longer to satisfy because of that, that particular leakage. Um, so my leakage is actually constant all the time, no matter what. No matter what the VAV box is doing, that leakage downstream is, percentage-wise, is always going to basically be the same. If my leakage is upstream of the VAV box, it's a little bit, oops, sorry, it's a little bit different scenario. Um, the flow through my VAV box, as you know, is independent of whatever pressure the duct system is operating at, and my CFM monitoring station on the inlet of my VAV box is going to get me that CFM no matter what. So if I have leakage upstream of the VAV box, my VAV box has to open more and more and more than it otherwise would have in order to get the CFM I need in the space, which causes my static pressure in the system to decrease, which causes my supply fan to speed up and use more energy. So any fractional leakage I have uh, an upstream of the VAV box is going to be a higher percentage at lower airflows than it is at higher at uh, higher airflows. And most VAV systems, if you observe them, tend to be operating in the lower range, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent is a pretty common range. You hardly ever see the fan operating at 90 or 100 percent unless it's a design day and nobody oversized it. Uh, so there can be some significant penalties on the VAV side because the fan is going to speed up to overcome that leakage, uh, which is good for the space but not good for my energy. Uh, exhaust systems uh, can cause fan flow to exhaust, to cause exhaust register imbalance. So um, I'm not going to necessarily get the right airflow coming out of each of the spaces that I think it's going to come out of. Uh, I'm going to hope to balance those things, which means I'm going to have to speed up my fan and balance down my registers. But a lot of that air is going to be sucked in from wherever, and in a lot of cases, wherever 
is the wall cavity or the ceiling plenum that my supply duct happens to also be running down in. Um, so I'm going to be short cycling the system in that regard as well. It's definitely going to cause excessive fan energy use. It's one of the biggest problems for duct leakage specifically. And it's going to help depressurize my building, which is obviously undesirable because if my duct is leaking in that cavity, some of that's going to be pulling from my conditioned air that leaked out of the supply duct, but some of it's going to be pulling through the sidewall or through the roof line or wherever it can pull it from through the path of least resistance. So putting my building into a negative pressure inadvertently is not desirable. Water, moisture intrusion, things like that will be coming along in. And it will also cause additional infiltration load. As you can see in that little red arrow on the left over there, if air is leaking in through that sidewall over there, now that air comes through my exhaust fan and mixes my conditioned air, it's going to cause additional problems because of that negative pressure. All right, from code perspective, you guys have all seen this chart. Um, the state code guys use it. I stole it from them. Um, but you can see over time we've had ASHRAE 90.1 energy standards and more recently, in the past decade or two, the IEC, International Energy Conservation Code. Most of you are probably aware that here in the state of Illinois, we are using the 2012 IECC. That is our current state code. It's been in effect for almost three full years. As a side note, if you didn't know, the 2015 IECC is slated to go into to effect in Illinois on January 1st, 2016. So you got another five, six weeks of, of designing less efficient buildings, and then you got to step it up a notch. Um, it was supposed to go into effect November 15th, but because of the state budgetary issues, things didn't happen when they wanted to, so they bumped the date back to January 1st. And I suppose they could bump it another month if they want to, because they could do whatever they feel like. But chances are it'll probably go into effect on January 1st, as it has done for the past several cycles. So January 1st, new code. Uh, but as you can see, the code gets stricter and stricter and stricter. And there are some, you know, slight improvements on the efficiencies that we're expecting for EER on cooling equipment and things like that. Um, but generally speaking, a lot of the, fan, the savings is coming from control sequencing and from fan energy savings. Um, and duct sealing is part of that discussion. So what specifically was required by the state of Illinois code in terms of duct sealing and insulation? All right, so the first thing you have to know is that uh, insulation is required on duct systems commercially, just like it is required residentially. This applies to all the duct work, the supply duct work, and the return duct work. I know in some buildings people like to insulate the supply for condensation reasons. They don't think about the return side, but you do have to insulate both. If the duct work is going to be in an unconditioned space, you have to insulate it to an R6 level. If you're going to run duct work outside, which is completely stupid, but if you have to do that, then you got to use an R8 insulation level and obviously make it waterproof as well. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Um, where the design temperature difference between the interior and exterior of the duct or plenum does not exceed 15 degrees. So if you're running your duct work through conditioned spaces, like say you're running it, say you're going to uh, uh, Chipotle, right? Lunch place, everybody's been there. The duct work's always exposed in those places uh, up there above up by the ceiling. You can see all the duct work. So chances of it being more than a 15 degree differential should be low and you might not have to actually insulate the duct work. Now, with that being said, as you're probably aware from my other classes, lots of systems use very hot supply heating air, much hotter than 15 degrees, even though ASHRAE specifically prohibits you from doing that, both in the handbook and in ASHRAE 62 ventilation standards. Um, so you should not have it be more than 15 degrees. So in a 75 degree room, the ductwork should never be supplying more than 90 degrees from overhead heating. But if it does, theoretically, you have to insulate that ductwork, right? Um, if you look there below the exceptions, all ducts, air handlers, and filter boxes shall be sealed. And all joints and seams shall comply with section 603 of the IMC, which we'll look at here in a second. Um, so we have to insulate the duct work if it's going to be in an unconditioned space or a what I'm going to call a semi-conditioned space. If you get it all the way fully in the conditioned space with no more than a 15 degree delta T, then you don't have to actually insulate it. You definitely have to seal the ductwork and the air handlers and the filter boxes. All got to be sealed. If you look at the International Mechanical Code, which is going to dictate to us a little bit more on how things need to be sealed. Um, there is some language in there. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because that would be boring. Um, but it's telling you where you have to physically do the sealing. So if you remember residentially last week, 
Um, we had to do duct sealing, and then in many scenarios, you have to do duct pressure testing. The pressure testing kind of makes the whole argument of what you have to seal go away. If they give you a target and you got to seal it to a certain number, who cares where you sealed it at, basically, right? You have to seal pretty much everything to get to the certain number. Commercially, we're not yet requiring duct sealing, at least not in most scenarios. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. We're not requiring duct sealing testing, but we are requiring duct sealing. So right now, it's still a visual inspected inspection for most commercial buildings, and we haven't switched to a performance spec like the residential side of the code has. Um, so when your inspector comes in, he's going to be expecting to see that you've sealed the longitudinal and traverse joints, and I'll show you diagrammically which ones those are. You're also going to have requests from your building inspector for UL listed products. Um, they're not going to want to see that, you know, thin, you know, uh, foil looking tape. Uh, they're going to want to see it stamped with a UL 181 stamp on it. Um, you also, as you can see here, you're allowed to use welding, which is very expensive. Uh, gasketing, mastics, which we'll talk about specifically here in a few minutes, um, sealant, liquids, uh, or tape. And the tape's got to be UL listed as well. Um, the UL uh, 181 standard just helps with the, the uh, pressure sensitivity of the tape and heat sensitivity of the tape. If you just put the quote-unquote cheap tape on there, chances are it's going to deform and peel off in a matter of a couple years. That's why they want to see the UL listed tape. Uh, if you look down here, there is an exception to this section, um, continuously welded. Obviously, you don't have to seal it with mastic and tape if you're going to weld it. Um, or if you have a locking system type joints um, and you're operating at a lower static pressure than two inches, uh, you do not have to have additional sealing on those mechanisms. So we have different classes of duct work in terms of duct sealing, uh, low, medium, and high. Uh, this is the language here for low pressure. I'll show you medium and high in a second. Um, so specifically here, um, we're looking at longitudinal and traverse joints, seams and connections of your supply and your return ducts operating at less than two inches of water column. That's most of your commercial systems. That's your typical rooftop category, you know, under 20 tons type equipment that you're going to see on 60% of the projects. When we get to bigger projects like hospitals and stuff like that, we won't be in the low pressure scenario. We'll be in either the medium or the high scenario. So these two inches of water common less systems that we're talking about here on, on the low pressure, and there you can use welding, gasketing, mastics, um, mastic fabric systems, tapes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you bump up a level to the medium pressure systems, um, this is for systems that are between two and three inches of duct static pressure. Um, and then high pressure systems are ones that are operated at more than three inches. And you can see when we go to that high pressure scenario, that's when additional rules start kicking in. So if you can design your system to stay under three and even better under two inches of static pressure, then you're going to be in a much better situation in terms of what you have to do by code. Um, so if you are exceeding three inches of duct static pressure commercially, that's where the rules kick in and then you need to do duct leakage testing. So residentially, anytime the duct work went outside the space we said last week, as soon as it went outside the condition space, you had to do it. Commercially, the rule is entirely different. It doesn't matter if the ductwork is inside the condition space or outside. As soon as you go above three inches of static pressure for your operating design, that's when you have to do the leakage testing. Then you have to get it down to a certain leakage rate. And this is the formula here in the code that dictates the leakage rate. And we'll look at it again when we look at the SMACN standard here in a minute. Um, but the uh, leakage class that you're trying to get down to um, is F which is the leakage rate that you're measuring in CFM for every 100 square feet of duct surface divided by whatever static pressure you did the test at to the 0.65 power. I don't know why someone had to make the formula so complicated, but that's what they chose to do. Um, so we'll talk about how that formula works a little bit more here in a second. Um, you don't necessarily have to test all the duct work. You have to test at least 25% of the duct surface area. Um, and submit that. Now, obviously, if all that ductwork fails or some good portion of it fails, you're going to see requests from your permitting guy or from your design engineer on the project asking for you to test more portions of the system, obviously. But if you can get 25% to pass, you should be in good shape. If you are a specifying engineer, what I would recommend is that you don't tell people which 25% you want tested until after all the ductwork is done and hung. Then, then pick the pieces that you want tested. And that will ensure that whoever's hanging the ductwork and sealing it is doing a good job on all of it, not just the part they know you're going to look at. Uh, a couple of questions came in. I'm going to see if I can read them real quick here. 
Uh, Ryan asks, uh, ICC requires minimum set point uh, 75 degrees and cooling the supplier is 58 degrees at most, resulting in a 17 degree difference. Um, and he's saying that that Chipotle restaurant should be insulating their ducks. Um, requires a minimum set point. Minimum set point is 75. Okay, that's what you're saying. Okay, yeah, I would say you're right in that regard, Ryan. I don't know that anybody's going to police that, but I would agree with you. Uh, Chris asks, how do you propose sealing an open return plenum above a drop ceiling? Uh, in my experience, there's considerable leakage to the exterior at the roof wall connection. All right, Chris, so in that example, you're using the ceiling cavity as your return ducting system. You don't have actual sheet metal. So there, the sealing process is going to be much more similar to doing building leakage sealing, because that's really what you're going to be doing. Um, so you want to seal the building envelope itself. Um, hopefully people are doing that anyway, but obviously it doesn't get done very well. But that's going to be the procedures you're going to use there. Generally speaking, that's going to mean that there's going to be people walking around with, you know, cans of expanding foam and caulk trying to seal up any penetration that was made to the exterior. So if somebody cut a hole in the exterior because they wanted to run a cable TV wire into the building or something like that, that hole has to be sealed up. Um, the leakage you have between the ceiling grid and the space, in the case of a dropped acoustical ceiling, you're probably not going to be able to seal that. Um, that's, that leakage going out from your space through there is should be under negative pressure if, because of the return duct, so it won't really be leakage. It'll be more air leaking, more air moving up through the return system. So you're more concerned about the sidewalls and then the roof leakage, uh, and that has to be treated more like a building than ductwork, but it would have to be sealed. Uh, the, Jeff asks, the energy code says ductwork doesn't need to be insulated if it's in a conditioned space. So that Chipotle example is good, right? Well, Jeff, that's what we were just debating when, with Ryan's question. We'll go back real quick. I didn't realize Chipotle was that exciting. So insulation, um, all supply and return ducts and plenum shall be insulated with a minimum of R6 insulation or located in unconditioned spaces and R8 if outside, right? So Conditioned spaces, what's that, right? Um, we're located within a building envelope assembly. The duct or plenum shall be separ separated from the building exterior or unconditioned or exempt from the R8 insulation standards. So let's see, the Chipotle example that I randomly picked out of my head that's now coming to bite me back on all the questions here. Uh, so it's, that would be a conditioned space um, located with movement. Yes. Okay. So I take it back, Ryan. Jeff is correct. Um, because that ductwork running in the ceiling of that restaurant example is conditioned space, it does not have to be insulated. Um, the exception number two, where design temperature difference between interior and exterior of the duct does not exceed 15, that would be not exceeding 15 from conditioned space, from ductwork to unconditioned space, or from ductwork to outdoors. So if you did the job in San Diego, maybe you don't have to insulate your outdoor ductwork. If you did the job somewhere and we're running the ductwork through an unconditioned mechanical closet or something, and it's only 15 degree delta, then you wouldn't have to do it there. The Chipotle example wouldn't have to be done at all. So my example choice was poor. My apologies. All right, so back to that uh, duct example there. So when we look at the ASHRAE ceiling classes, and we'll look at ASHRAE and SMACNA separately, they're two slightly different classes, but they're very similar in terms of their goals are. Uh, the ASHRAE duct ceiling classes come out of standard 90.1, which is the energy efficiency standard, as you're probably well aware. Uh, we have a column for return duct, a column for exhaust duct, and two columns for supply duct, depending on whether it's above or below two inches. And then each one of these categories gets an A, B, C, or D on it. Uh, C means that we have to seal the traverse joints only, right? So that's the cross-sectional direction of the duct, not the long direction, right? So that would apply if I have um, ductwork in condition spaces on the supply side, less than two inches. I got to seal the traverse joints, right? Don't have to seal the longitudinal seams, which would be category B. But then as soon as I take that two-inch ductwork from a condition space and I put it in an unconditioned space, then I have to do the traverse joints and the longitudinal longitudinal seams. Uh, and then it also will prohibit me from using tape. So as soon as I take my ductwork from conditioned to unconditioned, 
then I have to stop using tape and I have to go to mastic or welding or sealant or something like that. And then if I go take that ductwork outside, it goes to a category A, which means do the longitudinal and traverse joints and all the duct wall, pen wall penetrations I have to seal. Um, and then I also have to be prohibited from using tape. Right? If I go to a higher duct static pressure, those rules all take a step, step up. Right? So then even in the condition space, I cannot use tape. So if you have supply duct work that's over two inches of static running in a condition space, you cannot use tape to seal it. Uh, exhaust system side, um, tape is never allowed there at all for ASHRAE 90.1. Um, the starting point is no tape and doing the traverse and longitudinal joints, and then it gets a little more critical as you move up in class. Right? And then the return duct work side follows the same as the supply under two inch. So you sometimes have to do insulation on the ductwork if it's an unconditioned space. Sealing you have to do whether it's conditioned or unconditioned, and then the level you have to seal it to uh, depends on what you got going on. If you look at the SMACNA categories, uh, it's a very similar scenario um, that we had there for ASHRAE, but it's a little bit different. Um, there's an A, B, and C class where, once again, A is the most stringent and C is the least. And C means I have to do the traverse joints only, just like it does for ASHRAE. However, in, in the SMACNA standard, instead of categorizing it by supply, return, and exhaust, and then supply pressure, it's just by pressure in the SMACNA standard. So if you're trying to follow the SMACNA standard, it's just by uh, pressure. And basically, if it's a two-inch system and under, you're in class C. You have to do the traverse joints and seal it to a certain rate, which we'll talk about here in a second. If you're at three-inch ductwork category, you got to do traverse joints and the seams, longitudinal seams. So then you're in category B. And if you're at four inches above, you got to do the joints, the longitudinal seams, and the wall penetrations. Um, so that's kind of similar to the ASHRAE one over here, but just slightly different on when the rules kick in. Um, what's really different about SMACNA and the reason the code language down here, the CL equals F divided by P to the 0.65 power, uh, that language comes out of the SMACNA standard, right? And the reason that's there in that case, because in those categories for IECC, you have to do the duct leakage testing. So not only have to seal it, you have to prove what you actually did. And as we said, for code purposes, you have to test at least 25% of it. The maximum amount of leakage you're allowed for each of these classes, class C, B, or A, depends on whether you have rectangular or round duct, right? And why would that matter? Round duct, as you might imagine, is less leaky, less leaky than rectangular duct because I typically only have one longitudinal seam instead of four. And typically, I'm doing it in larger sections. Right? I'm probably going to be buying 10-foot sections of spiral or round pipe um, whereas rectangular, I'm probably going to be working with much smaller sections, three, four, five feet or something like that. So the smaller the sections, the more connection points, and hence the most, more potential leakage. But depending on whether you're A, B, or C, and whether you're round or rectangular, will determine the leakage maximum that you're allowed. So here's the way this formula works. The leakage maximum is expressed in CFM at whatever test pressure you've chosen. SA in this formula is the surface area. So how much duct surface area do you have in 100 square feet, right? So if it's a rectangular duct, then it's the left side plus the right side plus the top plus the bottom of whatever section of duct work I'm going to be testing. Um, and it's only 100, foot increment, 100 square foot increments. P is whatever pressure I've chosen to do this testing at, and that's measured in inches of water column. Um, and that P is multiplied to the 0.65 power for whatever reason they developed the formula that way. Um, and then what leakage class am I at? Um, so, for example, we'll bust out the calculator here. Now, I'm just going to make up numbers because I'm lazy. Uh, and let's just say I have a 2-inch or under duct system. i got to get rid of this weird red dot or I can't use the calculator. Uh, hopefully you guys can see the calculator there. Um, so let's say i got a 2-inch uh, or under operating system. And let's say it's rectangular duct work. So I'm looking at that 24 number is my CL number. Let's say I'm going to test it at one inch of pressure because that makes the math really easy for me. So one to the 0.65 power is still one. And then surface area, let's just make that easy and say I have 1,000 square feet of surface area for this piece of duct I'm going to test. So 1,000 times one times my CL of 24. Like I said, I didn't really need a calculator. That's going to be uh, oh, divided by the 100. So 240 CFM is what I'm going to have as my maximum leakage for that piece of ductwork that I'm testing. 
All right, if I did round pipe, it would have been actually uh, half, 120, because I would have had 12 instead of 24 in the formula there. So hopefully that makes sense to people. Um, what you're basically seeing is that the higher the static pressure you operate at, the, must, the much less the leakage rate is going to be allowed to, to be operated at. Um, and that's because obviously the higher the static pressure, the more CFM is going to leak out of a given size hole. Um, in terms of what things look like, um, probably should I showed you this earlier just to kind of help people that don't know ductwork as well out. The traverse joints, that's the, jo the, the connections that are going, you know, the cross-sectional direction here. So from left to right on there. The longitudinal seam, as you would imagine, is going the long way the duct works. So in rectangular, I have one, two, three, and then the bottom four of those guys on there. Whereas if I have round pipe, it's typically just bent, you know, a flat sheet of stock that's bent up, and I only have one longitudinal seam in that regard. Um, so the places that things leak a lot, the longitudinal seams usually aren't that bad. They're actually pretty decent, and which is why you see on the low static pressure systems, you don't really have to deal with them as much as you do as the traverse joints. Um, those are typically pretty decent on the long distance there. The traverse joints are typically bad, and it's the corners that tend to be the worst when we do sealing and we do pressure testing with smoke pens and stuff like that, or theatrical smoke machines, we tend to see it leaking out of those, those four corners where my little red dot is at. That tends to be one of the, the higher leakage points there. The other thing that will obviously leak a lot, other than the joints not being sealed well, is people penetrating our ductwork to use it for their stuff. Uh, this happens a lot more residentially than it does commercially, but it still does happen commercially. People run data cabling and stuff like that through ductwork all the time because there's a pathway, right? So they'll poke a hole in the side of the duct, they'll run data cable through the duct, then poke it back out the other side. I'm not saying that's something that should be allowed by most of the fire codes or anything like that, or electrical code. People do it, uh, so we got to pay attention to that kind of stuff, especially on existing systems. Um, generally speaking, if you have spiral duct work, you're probably not going to have to seal that. It's pretty tight on its own. You have to seal the, uh, the connection points of this piece of pipe to that piece of pipe, but you won't have to actually seal all the spiral itself. Um, down the seams of the spiral. Um, so regardless of what type of connection you're using on the rectangular ductwork, um, they're pretty much all going to have some leakage associated with them. Um, it's very hard to have things just metal pressing up against metal and make it really tight. Gasketing helps with that, obviously. Um, welding would help with that, obviously, but both those are pretty uh, uncommon. So using mastic is probably the way we're going to go with a lot of this stuff. why this mouse doesn't want to cooperate. Oh, now it pops up. All right, so when we do duct pressure testing, which is required on the higher static pressure systems, like we said, um, four inches and up, uh, but it's something you can still do on lower systems, and I would recommend that if you're concerned about um, pressure, especially if you have um, manufacturing areas where I can't have this air leaking to that area, or food storage areas, or hospitals where pressurization is a concern, you're going to want to test the leakage of the duct system. If it's something general, like an office or a school, you're probably going to test just pieces of it. If it's a hospital or something like that, you're probably going to test 100% of it. So how do we actually test the duct leakage? Um, first thing is we need a fan to pressurize the duct system. We're not going to use the fan in the air handler. We need a fan that has a specific known curve associated with it that we can tie into our manometer and link these things together. Um, so residentially or like commercial, we use a thing called the duct blaster. For larger commercial systems like you're seeing here, you've got a much uh, beefier uh, centrifugal fan instead of the prop fan you would have on a duct blaster. But the same basic idea is going to be there. We've got a fan with a known um, curve to it. So when we measure the pressure with the manometer, we can plug that fan curve into the manometer, and it's going to be able to graph out for us the different airflow rates that we're seeing. The fan has to have speed control on it, um, on the larger ones, a VFD, on the smaller fans, some kind of ECM motor. But i got to be able to change the speed up and down in order to get the different airflows at different static pressures to do my testing. i got to have a way to measure the airflow. Uh, so there's going to be a manometer connected to some kind of flow station on there so I can read that, or I'm going to have a cross flow plate or something like that. Um, and i got to connect this to the duct system. Sometimes we'll also use a smoke generator. Um, where that fan is sucking air in, if we put a smoke generator there, that'll allow that theatrical smoke to go out and work its way out the ductwork, and then we'll be able to see where the leak is actually at. Um, that's helpful if I'm trying to actually fix, repair, and further seal the ductwork. 
Um, most of these tools and instruments are already set up to work with a specific fan that you're connecting it to, or they can be configured to work with that specific fan. And it's not just going to give you the pressure, but it's going to give you the pressure. It's going to give you the CFM. Most of them will have places where you can input the surface area of the piece of ductwork that you're actually testing, uh, and then it'll actually do the calculations uh, for you. And in this case, it'll show you what class you are, tightness class B, uh, etc or the CFM you're leaking. So in this case, it was 90.95 CFM of leakage. When we do this test, we have to go and seal off all the intentional openings. Um, these are more residential looking photos that I have on here, but the concept is basically the same. I want to go seal off all the supply grills and all the return grills that I'm working with because those are intentional openings. So air moving out of those is not leakage. That's what's supposed to happen, right? So I want to seal off the intentional openings and then I want to just test things that are leaking where they're not supposed to be leaking. Um, sometimes the ductwork is very large. Um, we'll have to break the ductwork into sections. So maybe we'll say, okay, we're going to test this, whatever, this 70 feet of ductwork. Right? So we'll open up the ductwork, you know, remove the connections on the left side, remove it on the right side, and cap the, those off, and then pressurize that 70-foot piece. Sometimes the systems are pretty small, like in the case of like commercial, and we can go tape off all these registers. And then just pick one point in the duct system to inject with. I say inject, I'm talking about by hooking this um, flexible hose off of this fan or this hard pipe one off of this fan, either way. Uh, and having a spot where I can let that air into the duct system and pressurize it from the inside out. So in another case, I'm going to seal off all the temporary, uh, all, all the permanent openings that I want to keep, like registers and so forth, and only test what's actually not intentional. Um, you can pressurize ductwork or you can depressurize ductwork. Um, just like when you do a blower door test on a building, you can pressurize the building or you can depressurize it. Generally speaking, I would prefer to pressurize the ductwork because then I can use a smoke machine to suck air into that fan and let it leak out the ductwork so I can see where the leaks are actually at. If I depressurize it, then I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, you do want to be cognizant of all the ductwork, uh, specifically supply and return ductwork. And then if you have outdoor air intakes, you're also going to test those for leakage. Um, if those are leaking, it can actually be more energy inefficient for your system than other spots on your system. Right? So if I have outside air intake duct work going from my louver to my air handler, and I'm leaking air in there, and I got my airflow monitoring station over by my, my uh, air handler, I think I'm getting a certain CFM of outside air, but really I'm getting 80% of that from outside and 20% is coming through the building leaking into the return duct itself. So return... Supply, return, and outside ductwork is all important for testing. All right, let's launch another quiz question here so we can get through all these questions when I find where I put my quiz question. Um, where's my question at? Okay, that's weird. I know you guys are all excited because the question box fell asleep. Okay, here we go. All right, so question number two. Duct sealing is required by which current codes in Illinois? Keyword current. Duct sealing is required by which current codes? All right, choice A, IECC 2009 and IMC 2009. Choice B, IEC 2012 and IMC 2012. Choice C, IECC 2012 only or choice D, lead in IECC. That is an acronym mouthful to read all that. All right, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right, put the results up here. All right, so 58% of you got the correct answer, which is IEC 2012 and, and IMC 2012. The next group picked the IECC only, and I'm starting to see that coming up as you guys are doing it. So that's why I was scrolling back here to bring up an old slide so you can see where most of you are probably getting held up. 
Um, I can just get to the slide that I want. All right, so as you know, state code is IECC 2012. And the reason the IMC comes into play, even though it's not, even though Illinois doesn't have a statewide mechanical code, it's specifically telling you here in the energy code that you have to comply with the mechanical code uh, for the duct sealing requirements here, section 603.9 of the IMC. That's why both of those are required and the answer is B. That was a little bit tricky apparently. I didn't think it was going to be tricky, but I guess it was. All right, let's get that caught up. All right, so ways we can actually seal this ductwork. Um, so last week we listed one more way on here that's not here now. Um, we listed regular foil tape for the residential group, and that is generally allowed. But commercially, uh, the cheap low-end foil tape is not permitted as a mechanism for sealing ductwork. The minimum is UL listed metal tape. So that other one I dropped off this list for the commercial group today. You have to use UL listed metal tape or better. What are some things that might be better? Um, sealing it with mastic typically does a better job than tape. Um, I know mastic can be messy to apply, but if you do it correctly and you get it into the joints, uh, it'll last longer than the metal tape will. Although the UL tape does pretty good, but you're heating it up and cooling it down, heating it up and cooling it down, and eventually it will get brittle and come off. The mastic will tend to last a little bit longer. Uh, welding is an option. Uh, you're probably not gonna do this for your typical office building, but if you have, um, um, I don't know, uh, an exhaust laboratory and you're really concerned about the fumes that you're exhausting, so you don't want any leakage coming out whatsoever, you might choose to weld that ductwork instead. It's more expensive, obviously, but it provides a very good tight seal. You can gasket the ductwork, right? So I can have flanges on two pieces of ductwork where I'm going to connect them, put a gasket between them, and then pressure close them together. That tends to work fairly well. Or you can use AeroSeal, which I'm sure most of you probably heard of. Uh, it's good for retrofits and stuff like that where the ductwork's already installed. And you can seal the ductwork from the inside out without gaining access to the ductwork. We'll talk about how that works, too. We'll talk about all these things a little bit here. Uh, so top left there, there's a picture of ductwork being AeroSealed. And we'll explain how that works in a little bit. Um, welding is sort of self-explanatory. You guys all know what welding is. I've got two pieces of metal, and I basically melt them together. That's welding. And if I got it all being metal, it's not going to leak very much. The two pictures on the right are showing mastic. Um, there's a couple different ways to apply that. It's frequently applied with a paintbrush, um, which is not always necessarily the best way to apply it. For you guys that were on the call last week, sometimes what happens with the paintbrush is that people paint the surface of the duct over the joint, and they think they did a good job because uh, they painted it, and it's all colored different. But really, you have to get the mastic down inside the joint. So the better ways to do that, there's a guy in the bottom using a putty knife that can be used, and, and you can push that material into the crack that way. Uh, you can use a paintbrush, um, but instead of painting the ductwork, you're using it, kind of pushing it in. Some guys will cut the paintbrushes down, cut like a third, come down to a third of their normal length so they're real stubby, and use that so that way it's, they're more inclined to shove it into the joint. Uh, the most successful people seem to use gloves, though, and not even use a brush. Um, so they'll just put, you know, a rubber glove on and just scoop a glob of mastic out of there and then use their fingers to physically press it into the joints because um, then you can feel what you're actually doing. But that's key. you got to get it into the joints uh, or it's not going to make a difference at all. All right. Question number three. Question number three is, what pressure is commercial duct tightness testing done at? What pressure is commercial duct tightness testing done at? 25 pascals, 0.1 inches of water column, any pressure measured in pascals, any pressure measured in water column. So far, we get answers all over the board. Um, I'll give you a slight hint uh, for you guys that are residentially orientated and you were on the call last week. It's not the same as that. 
what we talked about earlier today is different than what we do residentially. All right, 79% of the people voted, so I'm going to close it in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, well, mo the, 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 most people got the correct answer here. Um, however, I, mean, I say most people, the, the more people got it right than, than other answers, but the correct answer is D, any pressure measured, measured in inches of water gauge. Um, the guys that were answering the 25 Pascal, which was 32% of you, that was the answer last week for residential. That was not the answer this week commercially. Uh, commercially, we tested all different pressures. We're not locked into one specific testing point. Uh, we, we use any pressure that we want to test at. Um, but then for the, all those formulas, it gets entered into the formulas in terms of inches of water gauge, inches of water column. So D is the correct answer on that one. All right, question number four. Let's populate that one up. All right, true or false, ductwork in conditioned spaces requires tighter ceiling levels than in unconditioned spaces. Dock work in conditioned spaces requires higher, excuse me, requires tighter ceiling levels than unconditioned spaces. True or false? So for everybody's getting this one right, I think it's a, it's a gimme. 84% of the people voted, so I am going to close it in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, so everybody got that one correct. Good job. Um, obviously, if it's an unconditioned space, leakage is more hazardous, more dangerous, more costly to us, so we require tighter levels of ceiling classification. So B, false, was the correct answer. All right, a little bit more here, and then we'll have one more question at the end. Um, describe what the AeroSeal process is for you guys that don't know. Some of you guys saw it last week, but it's a similar kind of thing. So basically what aero seal is, is another way to seal ductwork. Uh, this is for ductwork that's already installed, whereas like welding you would do as you're doing it. Um, aero seal you would do once all the ductwork's installed or even as a retrofit to existing ductwork. Uh, so the way it basically works is you need to go plug up all the intentional openings. So all of the supply or return registers have to be physically blocked off because I don't want to seal those closed. Obviously, I only want to seal leaks closed. And then what you do is you cut into and connect to the duct system with this calibrated pressurized fan and an injection assembly. Injection assembly is, we call it a wand, but basically is just taking a glue sealant type product and misting it into an aerosol based sealant. And that sealant then goes down this bag, which looks like this bag right here on the right, goes down that bag into the ductwork system and moves its way through your entire duct system. So you're sealing off all the intentional openings, pressurizing the duct system with this fan and then injecting um, aerosol based sealant into the air. So what happens then is it moves down the duct system, and if there's a leak, obviously there's higher pressure in the duct and lower pressure outside the duct, so air is going to leak from inside to outside the duct. And when it does that, this aerosol-based glue is going to leak out with it, and it's going to catch the edge of the crack, right? And as we exit the duct work, we go into a lower pressure scenario, so it doesn't move out quite as much, but if we exit the crack, this little glue ball, if you will, adheres to the crack, and the next glue ball adheres to him, and the next one adheres to him, and the next one adheres to him, and you basically scab over the holes with a glue-type product. That's kind of the, the crude, simplified version of what this thing actually does. Uh, very similar to what we do on other testing. These pictures are residential just because that's what I happen to have, but it's the same process. You're sealing off all the intentional openings just like you do on a code-type test, blocking all those off. Um, you're doing a pretest to see how much leakage you actually have, right? So exact same kind of test we were talking about before. Uh, this case we're doing it with a computer so you can graph it all out and everything. But it's the same basic idea. I want to know how much I'm actually leaking out. Then what we do is we take foam blocks and we actually plug them into all the registers so no air can leak out of them at all. So all of the glue is being forced to the cracks and not coming out any intentional openings. We also would block off any mechanical equipment. In this case, it's a residential uh, fan coil, but we'd be blocking off commercial air handlers or rooftops or something like that. So basically, we're isolating the ductwork from the equipment and from the space. So we're just sealing ductwork. 
Um, and then you pressurize the system. You can see down here in these bottom pictures what it actually looks like when it fills up the cracks. So this is sealing a uh, joint. This is sealing a, a corner area, right? Those little white dots are just all little molecules of white glue building up on each other until the crack is fully, fully sealed. Well, it's not super complicated. It's fairly, fairly easy to conceptualize. Here's a left hand and a right hand before and after picture. There was a crack there where the connection was not made very cleanly and the glue basically fills that up, as well as the traverse joint going across the top there, too. Uh, and then we'll do a post-test, which is the same test you do at the beginning, um, so you can see how much you actually improve the system, so you get a before and after sna snapshot. And then you obviously got to go remove all the temporary things you did to plug the duct system up. Um, so there are some advantages of doing this over, over Mastic, although Mastic does work perfectly fine. Um, if, like I said, you take the mastic and you shove it into the joints and not just paint over the top of the metal. Painting over the top of the metal just makes the metal ugly. Uh, you got to actually shove it into the joints. Uh, the other nice thing about sealing with aerosol-based stuff, and I should mention AeroSeal uh, is a trade name for aerosol-based solutions. Um, the Department of Energy invented this technology 20-some years ago, um, and they have licensed it to a company that was formed to specifically market it called AeroSeal. Um, but it's, it's, it's the main way that it's getting done. Um, so you're sealing everything that you can get to when you do with mastic. So whatever you can see, you can seal with mastic. But if you can't see it or it's butted up against the wall, how are you going to go seal the other side of that? Whereas an aerosol-based solution pressurizing the duct, it seals every hole and every crack, not just the ones that you can physically, physically see. Um, then we can get down to, to lower rates. Sealing is usually pretty quick residentially. Commercially, it'll take days and days to get a lot of duct work. But a house, just to give you an idea of time frame, a house typically is like five, five and a half, six hours, and you're done with a house. Um, the actual sealing time at a house is typically about a half an hour, but you got a lot of setup and, and prep and a lot of cleanup time. Um, here's an example of what one would look like commercially. This is the kind of data you would be looking for um, for a... Uh, for duct leakage test anyway. So it's kind of nice when you do an aerosol-based solution thing with, a, with software, because you're already doing the test that you would have had have done for code anyway. So in this case, um, the leakage was tested to be 3,300 CFM of leakage, and that's equivalent to having a 124-inch square hole, right? Not one giant hole, but a bunch of little tiny pinholes that add up to one giant hole. And after sealing this, which took 55 minutes in this case, if you look at that graph, it was down to 178 CFM of leakage which is a seven inch hole, um, which is a 95% improvement in this case. And they tested this one at 375 pascals. Um, 375 pascals is, what is that? Because I'm lazy. Um, so that's 1.5 inches of static pressure. Uh, so pretty normal operating pressure is what it was, what it was tested at. That just gives you an idea of, of the kind of improvement you might be able to see in a fairly fairly quick time frame. Uh, so duct sealing in general, uh, there's lots of benefits like we were talking about. We've got like three or four more slides, then we'll do the last question and we'll wrap up here. I won't read every one of these slides to you, just to give you an idea of the different market segments where duct sealing does play a role. Uh, schools, uh, it's very helpful. And this is a small school in Ohio. Um, this particular school was losing 55% of their treated air. So 55% duct leakage um, was, was what they were having to deal with. And their main result was they were not able to heat and cool specific spaces, uh, especially, obviously, classrooms at the end of the duct run. Uh, when they were done, it was only leaking 2% of the air after they got done sealing it. Uh, total duct leakage improvement was 27,000 CFM at this one school, which is $45,000 a year. So they got duct work located in you know a single story school. So a lot of that leakage is actually leaving the building. Uh, so it's a pretty huge improvement in energy, which is helpful for them paying their project back. But the real motivator was getting heating and cooling to the right rooms. Uh, healthcare is very popular with duct sealing for obvious reasons. Um, healthcare and laboratory environments are some of the more popular ones because there you're really concerned about, well, what class of air am I accidentally leaking into a different class of air? Right, so if I can make sure I'm not leaking any or hardly any, uh, it's much more beneficial to me, less lawsuits and things like that, less health problems and so on. Um, so this was a, a healthcare project, uh, but, it wasn't a, a, but it was a lab exhaust hood that had radioactive isotopes. Um, 
So in this case, they were having trouble getting occupancy to the to the property because they had to ensure a certain uh, leakage rate before they could do so because they don't want radioactive isotopes leaking into other spaces. Uh, and they were having difficulty getting that taken care of. So I had to do some additional sealing in order to do that. Energy, not a concern, right? First cost, not a concern. They had to get the leakage down. So there's different drivers for different kinds of projects. Um, this one is actually an overseas project. Uh, same kind of problem though, they were not able to get their occupancy permit because the duct leakage rates were not meeting the engineers uh, and the code required original specs. And what they're actually doing on this property is they were actually sending dudes down on harnesses down the shafts, fairly large shafts, and trying to get them to seal the ductwork from the inside there because they had already put all the furnishings, wall finishings and everything on. So sealing from the outside of the ductwork was very difficult. So they were sending dudes down on, on, a, on a pulley um, with a harness on trying to seal the ductwork from the inside. I'm not sure that the OSHA confined spaces rule you know, applies in this country, uh, but they were having difficulty doing that. So sealing it with other mechanisms, like in this case, they use AeroSeal uh, is helpful. Um, so there's a bunch of them like this on here, um, just popping some of these up on the screen for you. But generally speaking, it ends up being one of two things that tends to drive a duct sealing, well, one of three things. It could be energy code, um, or it could be someone's just concerned about their energy dollars and they want to slow down their exhaust fans and save that money, or, which is a lot of the cases, they're really concerned about what is leaking from this airstream into this other space. So that's where the medical and laboratory people get really excited. Um, there's not too many direct incentives from the utilities for duct sealing. You can do duct sealing with all of the Illinois utilities as a custom rebate. Um, for you guys that do commercial work, you know what the custom rebate is. It's not a list of stuff like put this VFD on or change this chiller out and you get this much money. It's do a project, show us all your engineering calcs, we'll calculate how much energy it's going to save, and then based on that, we'll pay you X dollars per therm or X dollars per kilowatt hour saved. So you can do duct sealing like that for NICOR, Peoples, North Shore, and ComEd. Uh, and Amron and, and anybody else for that matter. Um, you can't do it that way, um, but there's no list of duct sealing rebates like there was residentially last week when we talked about it. The other thing is that on the uh, NICOR side of the equation and the ComEd side of the equation, multifamily projects and small business projects can actually do on-bill financing programs for different incentives, which if you're getting a rebate for your duct sealing, then that would become an incentive and you could do uh, that as part of your project as well. Uh, so you could finance the project at a fairly low rate of 5.99% uh, through the utility if you're doing that kind of work. All right, let's get our last question populated up here so you guys don't get mad at me for talking too much. Uh, questions? All right, here it goes. So true or false, commercial duct sealing is mandatory statewide in Illinois. All right, 85% of the people voted, so I will close it in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And most of you got that correct. The answer is A, true. Duct sealing is required statewide in Illinois. The levels at, to which you have to seal it are different depending on the class of ductwork that you're dealing with, but all the ductwork has to be sealed. Um, all right, so... 77% of you got that correct. All right, last couple things I just mentioned, there's tons and tons of other resources out there. EPA has a bunch of data. There's a couple ASHRAE articles that are fantastic uh, for commercial duct sealing. This one's it's 10 years old now, but it's a great article. If you're an ASHRAE member, you can go online and pull down any uh, previous ASHRAE journal articles. If you're not an ASHRAE member, call me. We'll, we'll figure it out and, and get you access to my magazines or whatever. Um, here's another one that's a little more recent from just uh, two or three years ago um, that concerning uh, energy audits in um, small office buildings and a big portion of that discussion was uh, was duct sealing. And there's just tons and tons of resources like that. If you need more data and more resources and you really want to read, uh, let me know and I'll send you a bunch of stuff. 
Uh, we got days and days worth of reading material for you. Uh, these are the people I stole stuff from, so thank you for letting me steal your information and your graphics. And if anybody has any further questions, uh, type them in or my phone number and email are on the screen there. You can hit me up later. And if I don't know the answer, I will research it and get you an answer. Uh, let's see if anybody typed anything in lately. Um, David asks, from an energy retrofit perspective, what would you see for paybacks? I'm assuming you're talking about like a simple payback in number of years. Um, it would vary w widely. Um, so residentially, the paybacks are reasonably long uh, because you don't spend a lot of money to heat and cool your house. Um, but it's still there's still a payback there, a payback story residentially. Commercially, like with many things like an ERV or thermostat or something like that, the paybacks are much faster than they are on small residential projects because you have so much more CFM that you're dealing with, so, so much more energy that can be saved. But the energy paybacks are going to be all over the board depending on where the payback scenario is coming from. So if you recall at the beginning, I was trying to kind of explain that like certain categories of ductwork, the higher the pressure, the faster the payback is going to be for sealing it, right? The higher the CFM, the faster the, pay work, the payback is going to be for sealing it. The location of the ductwork, if it's in an unconditioned space versus a conditioned space, faster the payback is going to be. Uh, if I'm able to adjust speeds of the blowers on fans, uh, especially like exhaust fans, stuff like that, versus that I'm just going to not suck as much air in the cracks, that kind of thing, then I can have faster paybacks as well. But it's going to be all over the board, David. It's going to be, it could be in some cases on a really crappy system. It could be literally measured in months. Uh, in other cases, it may be three, four, five, six years kind of scenario. It really depends on the project. It's not a simple answer like we had last week residentially with some of this kind of stuff because there's so much variability in the size of products that we're talking about. Uh, as an example, though, to help support your question, let's put that back up there. Um, this particular uh, FEMP study did not, you know, do simple payback type scenario. Uh, however, it did do a cost effectiveness study as part of this test, and then it ranked them. So even though duct sealing was the eighth best thing you could do to save energy in your building on this study, it was the fifth most cost effective, right? I know it doesn't give you a simple answer in terms of like how many months is it going to pay back, Ryan, but it, it gives you an idea that it is not only a good energy saver, but that it's also cost effective relative to other things. Um, so I don't know how, if that helps answer it or not. The other thing too is like when you compare it to other stuff like condensing boilers, right? So condensing boilers cost a ton of money, way more than duct sealing probably would, right? But in these particular studies, we're not looking at the cost of the condensing boiler. We're looking at the incremental cost of the condensing boiler because we're going to do it when your other boiler is dead. Your boiler died, you're going to replace it. Okay, to buy another legal minimum efficiency boiler, it would cost me whatever, 20 grand to buy the condensing boiler, it's going to cost me 26 grand. Therefore, the condensing technology only cost me six grand. And I do my payback calculation on that because you're going to buy a boiler anyway. With duct sealing, you weren't going to buy anything anyway as a retrofit in your question, David. You weren't going to buy anything at all. So the full cost of it goes into the calculation of how cost effective it is. Um, but it's, it's like I said, it's on the list for one of the most cost effective, but it's really hard to give you a specific like monthly or yearly answer. If you got a specific job in mind, we can work with your engineer to help calculate it if you want. Let's see if any other questions popped up on here. Don't see anybody else's questions typed in. Um, so with that, I am going to stop the recording and shut it down. If you have any other questions, uh, call me or email me later. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it.